Speak of the quiz, it wasn't our best quiz. <laughs> but, uh, so this first question, leafhoppers uh, prefer to feed on host plants with smooth, hairless leaves. Knowing this, a grower plants a crop variety with pubescent or hairy leaves in order to reduce leafhopper damage. This is an example of what type of host resistance? Uh, we would consider this most accurately to be anti-sinosis or behavioral non-preference, right? It is the behavior of the leafhopper that they would rather mate on hairy leaves than to deal with hairless one, or other way around, excuse me. And so it falls under that sort of behavioral resistance. We're not using chemicals in the plant to directly kill it, so it's not anti-biosis. Mm, excuse me. But yeah, and we'll go over those in more detail as we move along. As far as the second one is concerned, in tree and vine crops, which of the following traits is determined by the scion? So which part of the uh, plant is the scion? That's the part that's wrapped to the rootstock. Right, exactly. It's essentially the top part of the plant. You have the rootstock, you have the scion on top of the rootstock. They're grafted together. So uh, I was trying to be a little tricky by putting in all of the above, and apparently it worked uh, in the terms of being just a little bit tricky. But the idea was that the scion can really only determine the resistance that is above the graft, right? Because the scion is just the tissue that is above that graft, it doesn't determine what's going on in the rootstock. So you can't uh, say resistance below the graft. And it often has very little to nothing to do with uh, the vigor or the cold hardiness. So we're looking for C on that one. So wait, that nothing to do with cold hardiness? <laughs> At least according to the book. What's the well, paragraph say? I don't know. It transitions very quickly to speak about the rootstock, yeah. and all of the other ones re refer to the rootstock. I know. Oh, I okay. Too, and I was like, oh. It's a bit of a quick transition. I didn't know if I had misread the question or didn't read the answers right or didn't deal with it. Oh, uh, okay, sure. I um, I, I couldn't select all the above, but I couldn't select none of the above. So I figured it had to either be cold hardness or resistance above the graft. Yeah, I thought it was a combination of those two as well. The cold hardiness and the resistance above yeah, the graft? Yeah. Okay. I knew it wasn't all of the above because of the. Well, I had to select all the above because there's two right answers. Right. Right. That's what I went with. Yeah. That's what you went with as well? Okay. So going strictly by what the book said, they listed it as just the resistance above the graft from these options. But I hear what you're saying about the, uh, the cold hardiness, that that could have an impact. Uh, it's not one that the book lists. So uh, yeah, yeah, feel free to come up and talk to me after the lecture and we can work something out. All right? It's two points. Uh, it's two points, but some, some people, well, yeah. it's, it's a matter of pride for some people. Well, yeah, me too. It's wrong, it's wrong. What about the other, what about our other grades? The other grades? The other grades are coming. I am, uh, <laughs> we had a bunch of grants due, I was working on those, uh, but I've been plugging away at everything else. It's always Bettis' excuse. I know. <laughs> it's weird that all of us faculty have the same excuses. It's almost like we all do the same job and have the same pressures. <laughs> or else we meet in secret cabals and come up with the same BS excuses when we don't grade your papers. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> but, uh. I'm plugging along on them. Uh, the, 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 the lab reports for the almonds are um, kind of all over the place. Some of them are pretty good. Some of them are not so good. You'll have to wait and see. <laughs> Sorry? I, I'll, I'll make sure to hand them back to you. They should definitely be done by next Tuesday. I've only got a handful left. And... Uh, and we'll see how that all goes and what that looks like. Rest, rest assured that you will have opportunities to uh, make up points if they end up a little bit rough. So, resistance. When we talk about resistance, in terms of control, we are typically talking about resistant plant cultivars. And a resistant plant cultivar is just any plant that has inherited characteristics that make it less, uh, basically make it so that it results in less pest damage or infestation over the course of the growing season, right? So inherited traits basically meaning they have some sort of gene 
that makes them less susceptible to pests. Now, one point that I think is important to make with this is that because we're basically saying that some plants are more resistant than others, resistance is sort of an inherently relative measure, right? You can only compare plants against one another. There are some plants that are maybe more resistant than others, and some plants that are more susceptible to pests than other ones are. There's not some standard grade that we use to determine whether a plant is resistant or not. They either take more damage or they take less damage. It's all comparative. And as I mentioned before, because these are inherited, we're generally talking about resistance that comes from genes. So that if we were to breed these plants, we would expect their offspring to also have resistance. So it's not some sort of environmentally induced condition. It's a genetic one. Uh, one other minor point to cover before we get going is the difference between a cultivar and a variety. Uh, generally, a cultivar is any uh, line of plants that has been bred through a sort of conventional, intentional breeding program, right? Whereas a variety are plants that are naturally occurring variants within uh, the species or the subspecies. So these are just sort of things that naturally occurred as people grew plants or made hybrids and the like, just sort of in their spare time. Now, according to the book, you cannot use these terms interchangeably, right? Uh, cultivar is a cultivar, a variety is a variety, and they are very different from one another. And from a plant breeding perspective, that's true. At the same time, if you're out there talking to growers, I'm sure you've heard these terms used interchangeably any number of times. And so uh, just to keep in mind, and if you want to be one of those people who goes around and corrects people for when they use the wrong term cultivar or variety, feel free, but it's not going to endear you to anyone, <laughs> except maybe plant breeders. So, resistant plants have a special place in my heart. I spent several years working on resistant plants research, and uh, I think, honestly, it's a fantastic tool in the sense that it is one of the most effective ways that we can control pests. It's also one of the very cheapest ways that we can control pests. Uh, sometimes you'll hear people talk about it in terms of control for the cost of seed, right? That essentially it's money you're going to spend on seed anyway, but why not spend that money getting a little bit of control by selecting a variety that is not susceptible to a particular pest? So just some examples throughout history of resistance that has been used very effectively. Sort of the classic example and the very first example, of course, is the uh, use of American rootstocks to defend European grapevines against grape phylloxera, right? Uh, which essentially led to the saving of the entire uh, wine industry in Europe, which is fantastic. And that was all due to just natural resistance in plants. And another example is one that's a little bit closer to home in California, which is that, uh, I want to say in the early 1900s, spotted alfalfa aphid was introduced to the Central Valley in California. And uh, it did a real number on the alfalfa crops, which was very problematic as um, uh, livestock was a much bigger industry back then than it is now. And so rather than sort of uh, res resorting to doing a lot of chemical sprays, a lot of effort was put into developing uh, resistant varieties, in particular this uh, MOPA uh, variety which had really great resistance. They started planting it, uh, more or less exclusively, and relatives of it. And they brought down these aphid levels to such a low point that biocontrol was able to provide a lot of the uh, control that they needed to push them down below that economic level. And ultimately, it's been estimated that it saves growers about $60 million in yield loss and control costs annually, uh, just in California alone. So on the grand scheme of things, though, the amount of value that we get from resistance plants is much higher than that. Uh, a publication, Plant Resistance Arthropods, back in 2005, they went through the literature and found all the economic studies looking at resistant plants, and they estimated the value around the $1.6 billion mark. Uh, but my thinking is that that's probably a huge underestimation of the value of these crops, because they were only looking at crops where there were major economic studies performed, but there are lots of crops where we use resistance that have never been studied from an economic perspective. There are lots of crops out there that use resistance 
that uh, we don't even think of it as resistance anymore because everybody uses the resistant variety uh, in, their, in their fields. And also, if you want to think about it, probably every single crop that we grow has been selected for resistance to some extent just because growers will go out there and they'll harvest the plants uh, that do the best and they only plant the seeds for the plants that do the best over the season. And you just slowly, naturally select for varieties that have resistance to pests. So resistance is kind of something we can do intentionally, but at the same time, it's something that we benefit from all the time right now. So as far as resistance is concerned, um, there are two major mechanisms that we talk about, and those would be vertical resistance and horizontal resistance. And what these two come down to basically is just the number of genes that actually provide the resistance in the plant. So as far as vertical resistance is concerned, we're talking about resistance that results from the activity of one or two major genes. Um, and typically these are genes that target pathogens and when they are turned on, they provide highly efficient control of those pathogens or insects or whatever it is that's feeding on the plants. So functionally, when a pathogen comes and infects a plant or when an insect starts chewing on a plant, there's kind of a two-way street of chemicals going on. On one hand, the pathogen or the insect is taking chemicals, taking energy from the plant and ingesting it. But on the other hand, the pathogen or insect or whatever is putting certain chemicals into the plant to make it easier for them to feed. And we oftentimes call these chemicals effectors. So in this little illustration here, what we've got is a green highlighted um, plant cell right here. We've got a blue pathogen. And the pathogen is sort of uh, just stealing away all sorts of nutrients from the plant trying to infect it. And part of that process is it has certain effectors that it puts into the plant, and those effectors are basically just in one way or another making it easier for them to feed on it. In the case of, say, uh, insects, a lot of these effectors are designed to disguise the feeding from the plant so the plant doesn't turn on its immune system. Or alternatively, they're designed to stop the plant from coagulating its sap so that they can keep feeding uh, without any trouble. However, sometimes the plant has special proteins, this little green guy right here, which would be called a resistance gene or a resistance protein. And these resistance proteins are basically proteins whose only job is to go around in the plant and to look for these effectors. And as soon as they find one, they turn on the, you know, uh, the immune system, trigger the immune response, and the plant basically starts putting, pumping out all sorts of defensive compounds out to target the pest. And so this is the basic idea behind vertical resistance, is that essentially you find a gene that codes for one of these uh, defensive compounds, these defensive resistance genes, that target these effectors, and you just uh, breed it into all the plants that you're raising. Because as soon as your pathogen comes along, as soon as your insect comes along and feeds on this plant, its immune system turns on and you get it, uh, basically all the feeding shut down immediately. Now can plants create their own? Yes, there's kind of a, there's a real arms race between insects, pathogens, uh, fungi, and plants that initially, we've got another factor here. You see this little Y-shaped construction right here? These are sort of, um, those are defensive proteins in the plant that are basically designed to detect general chemical motifs from pests. A lot of them are uh, chitin detectors, so they can detect fungi as well as insects because they basically can fit onto chitin molecules and it sends an immune system response. Uh, some of them are designed, in this case, this would be one that uh, can detect flagellum proteins on pathogens. So that was, that's like the oldest form of immunity in the plants. Uh, and basically what most of these effector molecules are doing is they're coming over here to this immune response and that's what this little... Uh, red block here is, and they're shutting it down. Those effectors basically can come in and shut down the immune response from those very old uh, sort of defensive pathways. And uh, so the plant basically has these R proteins to stop the effectors from shutting down the initial immune response. And then you've got some insects or pathogens that have developed effectors that attack the R genes, 
And so it's kind of, it stacks up on top of itself, layer upon layer of complication. Plant, uh, plant pathogen responses and immune responses are kind of cool, very complicated though. But so that's vertical resistance, is essentially you've got an R gene that recognizes the pest and turns on the resistance mechanism, or the, sorry, the, yeah, the resistance, the immune mechanism. And this is a really popular type of control. Uh, typically, when you talk about resistance, you're talking about vertical resistance uh, because it's really easy to breed. If all you have to do is make sure that a single gene is getting into your resistant crop variety, then, you know, it makes the breeding really easy. Uh, the challenge here, though, is that essentially the pathogen or the insect or whatever it is, all they need to do is change one of their genes in order to overcome that resistance, which is a pretty easy task evolutionarily. So it's really easy to evolve resistance. And so you tend to see vertical resistance will last for a couple of years and then it'll kind of fall by the wayside and stop working. Just like any uh, sort of insecticide or pesticide that we use. Now, in order to get around this, we can make resistance, vertical resistance, that is uh, basically more effective by using multiple genes to create a really complex resistance mechanism. There's two ways we get around this, one of which is we can do pyramiding, where basically we take two of these R genes, these uh, vertical genes, uh, that basically detect different resistance mechanisms, sorry, that provide different resistance mechanisms. So basically we're just taking two vertical genes that provide resistance in two different ways, and we're putting them into the same plant. Alternatively, we can do stacking, where you take two or more vertical genes uh, but they provide the sh same mechanism. It's just like you have a backup gene that'll uh, just sort of pop in if the first one has some sort of uh, failure in the control. So in that sense, you can imagine that pyramiding genes, having two genes that have two different uh, immune functions, is much more stable and lasts much longer than putting two in that have the same mechanism. But sometimes you don't really have choices in which genes you can use. You just have the ones that people know about. People are still writing. Give them a minute. What if that sets up for failure Yeah, so that's a good point. Is that if we're doing something like a pyramid, right? And we have a we have a plant. It's got two different resistance genes, and so the theory here is that even if a uh, pathogen comes along that's resistance that has immunity to resistance gene one, resistance gene two will kill it, right? Or detect it and turn on the immune response. Uh, but there's always the idea that over time, and because pathogens have such large populations, they breed so quickly. There's always the chance that you'll get a pathogen that is resistant to both genes just by random chance. And eventually, you are setting yourself up for failure, right? That you will have this breakdown eventually. So the basic idea here is that a pyramid is not necessarily a fix-all, but it can significantly increase the lifespan of the technology. The key here is that if you're going to introduce a plant with two genes, you've got to make sure they're two brand new genes that the pest hasn't encountered before, right? It doesn't do you any good if you have the first gene is one that you've been using for a long time and a whole bunch of them have resistance to because then you're basically, you know, introducing a plant that only has half of the resistance you promise. So that's, that's something that you see a fair bit is, especially in genetically modified crops, they'll be like, we're, resist we're, we're putting out this brand new stacked corn, right? And it's got like three BT genes in it. But two of those BT genes have been on the market for like 10 years and have tons of resistance built up to them. So it's like, yeah, great, I've got two BT genes that don't work and a third one that's brand new, but you know, I'm not getting any of the benefits of stacking my genes. All right, so on the flip side, there's horizontal resistance, uh, which as opposed to vertical resistance is when resistance is polygenic, meaning that it comes from multiple genes uh, not just a single source. And these genes originate from multiple uh, defensive mechanisms. So we're not just looking at, say, a single sort of uh, 
our gene that is detecting a pathogen, but you have multiple different defensive pathways, whether maybe one of those is an R gene, maybe one of them is that the plant just naturally produces more defensive compounds all the time, right? <laughs> and generally, by having uh, many genes all working together, the resistance we get is much longer lasting. Uh, it gives resistance to many different pests, uh, including even those that may be resistance to uh, one or two of the mechanisms that the plant has. Mm, excuse me. And uh, the challenge with this, though, is that it's really, really hard to breed, right? It's easy to breed plants to make sure they have one gene, but it's hard to create a plant that has, say, seven, eight, maybe a couple dozen resistance genes all in it that all work together in a really nice way. Rather, that's the pattern that we see natural evolution takes, is that natural selection over thousands of years gets us to that point, not sort of conventional breeding over a handful of years. So there's a particular crop, uh, well, it's actually not a crop, this wild potato, Solanum verni, which has really great horizontal resistance to a lot of pests, but in particular this uh, potato cyst nematode, which is a big problem in some areas. And they've been trying really hard for years and years and years to crossbreed this with cultivated potato to create horizontally resistant um, potato varieties. And they just had no luck. That a lot of these genes um, seem to be tightly linked with traits that aren't good for cultivation. And so it's really hard to produce a resistance potato, resistant potato that grows really well in a field and produces really nice potatoes that people like to eat. So this is what's tricky about sort of breeding is that oftentimes you get a lot of unexpected and undesirable traits. All right. So the types of resistance. That's how we basically organize the genes that provide us resistance. But what types of resistance do we get? Well, you can basically break it down into two major categories. Tolerance and what we would call true resistance. So tolerance is essentially any plant that has the ability to endure the presence of a pest with little or no long-term damage. So essentially, it would be like having, say, two alfalfa varieties, one that is supposedly resistant to spotted aphids versus one that isn't. You go out in your field and they have identical spotted aphid numbers for the entire season, but when you go out and you do your mowing, you'll find that the tolerant variety has a higher yield than the susceptible one that it seems like the aphids just don't do as much damage on the tolerant plant, even though they have just as much of a pest problem. So uh, there's any number of mechanisms that can allow tolerance to work, um, such things as, well, as are listed there, compensatory growth, wound healing. But there are some big advantages to this, uh, one of which is that you may see a lot of your biocontrol in the field. So since you're not killing the pest off, you're keeping a lot of biocontrol agents around. You're keeping their food source in there, which is nice. Um, it's really hard to evolve resistance to tolerance as well because you're not killing the pest. You're not selecting for those that can overcome. You're keeping all of the genotypes in the population all the time. So resistance evolution slows way down. Uh, but there are some challenges to tolerance. Uh, on a very practical level, the challenge to tolerance is that you are keeping all the pests in your crop. So if you're growing next to another crop that is not tolerant to it, you're basically creating a reservoir of pests that could move into there. It might make you really unpopular with your neighbors. Uh, then on the flip side, it's really hard to identify what plants actually are tolerant. Because it's easy to walk out into a field and look at an alfalfa variety and say, boy, there are a lot less aphids on this one than there are on that one. But to figure out if something's tolerant, you have to rear the plant out all the way to the harvest, and then you have to basically measure how much, uh, how much damage it took from pests. You have to measure how much yield it had. You have to do a lot of uh, comparisons, and that's more than a lot of people do when they're trying to find resistant plant varieties. So tolerance isn't super common, but it's kind of very popular right now amongst people who talk about resistance. There's a lot of effort to try and breed more tolerant crops as opposed to uh, traditionally resistant crops. So here's just an example of a tolerant crop. This is um, a wheat variety, Cargill Hybrid 797. 
which was bred for tolerance against the green bug aphid. And so essentially we've got two resistant varieties, these cargills, and then we've got two susceptible varieties, golden harvest and garst. And so what we have here is the insect days, which is just a measure of how much damage the plants took. Basically, how many days did the insects feed on them at what population? And then we have the plant damage, uh, which is measured as a percentage. And a high percentage is more damage, a low percentage is less damage. And so what you can see here is that generally, Cargill 797, our resistant, our tolerant variety, has just as many aphids, just as much aphid damage as golden harvest or garst, but it took only 50% damage as compared to 87 or 99% damage, right? So about half the damage for the same number of aphids. Now, 50% damage isn't really ideal, but again, if you're accounting for the fact that you're taking a lot less damage, you can basically say that uh, I'm, I'll allow larger insect populations, we'll just spray a little bit less frequently to control them. So you could easily get that 50 much closer to the zero range if you incorporated some other controls in addition to your tolerance. So on the flip side of tolerance, we have what most people consider to be resistance, which would be true resistance, or plants that support very few or no pest individuals uh, by basically having a negative effect on the pest's behavior or on its biology, right? So there's something about this plant that makes it really undesirable to pests. So there's a couple different ways that plants get at this, uh, one of which is antizoonosis or non-preference. Uh, this is a change in the plant structure or chemistry that makes it unattractive or repellent to the pest. So it doesn't actually harm the pest. It's not producing defensive compounds. It's not uh, actually killing the pest. It's just making itself really, really unattractive. The pest encounters it either doesn't recognize it as a host source, or it basically says, this is not the host I want to feed on, I'll find something else, and it moves on. So, nice thing about this is kind of the same idea of tolerance. It's really hard for a pest to evolve resistance to this sort of thing because we aren't actually killing the pests. We're just not allowing them to feed, so we're keeping all the susceptible genotypes in the population. On the downside, if the pest doesn't have alternative hosts, a lot of pests will just sort of swallow their pride and they will feed on the plant that's not desirable. Uh, you know, they'll just sort of say, ah, I'm stuck with it, I don't have anything else to eat. And so antizoonosis may only go so far, provided they have options. Do you need a little more? Yep, I'll go back. All right, so within that non-preference, we have a couple ways that plants can get at that. On one hand, there's allelochemical non-preference. So this is when plants produce a uh, chemical. Well, actually, I put it differently on the slide. Either way, the plant has some sort of chemical profile that makes it um, non, uh, basically so that the pest does not recognize it as a host. This can either be a chemical that repels the insect or it could be a uh, chemical that the pest needs in order to recognize the plant as a host, right? So insects, pathogens, all kind of live fundamentally in a chemical world. They go around, they feel around with their antenna, or they're swimming in a chemical soup, essentially. They're picking up on subtle chemical cues, and they use those cues to recognize their hosts and what they need to feed on. So if we remove those cues, then they can't recognize the host, they can't feed on it. Uh, this is used to control spotted cucumber beetle, 
These beetles um, feed on all sorts of uh, cucurbit crops, uh, so melons, uh, gourds, those sorts of things. And their big feeding attractant is a specialized chemical these plants produce called cucurbitus, cucurbitacins. Cucurbitacins. And so some people, some uh, breeders, have bred plants that have much lower concentrations of these cucurbitacins uh, than they normally would. And it's been demonstrated that the beetles have a much harder time recognizing these plants as something they can eat, uh, just because they don't have that characteristic chemical anymore. On the flip side, you also have morphological non-preference, which is the same idea, except that the plant has some sort of structural characteristic that disrupts the normal behavior of the pest and basically makes it harder for them to recognize it as a host. So this is kind of getting at the idea of what I was talking about with the uh, leaf hoppers in the quiz question. The idea that if leaf hoppers are looking for a certain substrate to lay eggs on, say a hairless leaf, once you put a hairy leaf out there, they're not going to recognize it as easily and they may avoid the plant in order to find a new place to lay eggs. Uh, this is used for protection against cotton bullworms in cotton, that they prefer sort of the opposite. They like nice hairy leaves to lay their eggs on. So breeders uh, specifically bred plants that had nice, smooth, hairless leaves. And if those are grown in areas with a lot of cotton bullworm uh, pressure, the pests tend to do much more poorly. They'll go out and actively seek hairy plants elsewhere to go and lay their eggs. All right. So then in addition to antizoonosis, we have antibiosis. Antibiosis is any mechanism that adversely affects the pest growth or reproduction when the plant is used for food, right? So essentially, antizoonosis stops the pest from utilizing the plant in the first place because they just don't recognize it as a host or they recognize it as a host, but it's not sort of their ideal host, so they go elsewhere. Antibiosis is the defense that takes place if the pest is going to feed on the plant, uh, and then, you know, it basically reduces its growth from that point on. So two major ways this happens, one of which is that the plant has some way to detect the pest and turn on its immune system, at which point it will produce all sorts of chemicals that inhibit pest growth. So sort of that R gene that we were talking about before, right? Uh, you have a pest feeding, the plant somehow recognizes its presence, turns on a whole ton of immune genes, and produces all of these chemicals that kill the pest. On the flip side, there are some plants that when they're being fed on will actually uh, have decreased nutritional quality. So they'll produce, say, less amino acids. Uh, they'll start producing nitrogen in ways that makes it less bioavailable to pests. So when the pest is feeding, they're getting much less nutrition than they normally would if they were feeding on a different plant. Uh, this nutritional quality is actually really important in some aphids, such as the pea aphid, that, uh, excuse me, since aphids basically feed on sap, where they get their nitrogen is very important. So if plants have less available nitrogen, or if the nitrogen's not in the right form, aphids do very, very poorly. Uh, on the flip side, using sort of the defensive compounds, uh, gasipiol, a defensive compound produced by cotton, mm, excuse me, is directly toxic to white flies. And so there have been white uh, cotton varieties that have been bred to have sort of excess gasipiol in order to provide more protection from this pest. Ah. And then we get some oddball forms of resistance that show up but are hard to breed for and are hard to utilize in the field. So we got induced resistance. Induced resistance is just a temporary form of resistance that is derived from plant conditions or from the environment. So essentially we're taking a plant that normally wouldn't be resistant. It would be a susceptible plant, but we put it under certain environmental conditions and that allows it to basically become resistant. So to go back to aphids, uh, again, sort of that low nitrogen condition. If you have plants that are in a very low nitrogen environment, aphids don't do as well. And sometimes what you see are really unusual cases where uh, one pest will come along and feed on the plant and basically will prime that plant's immune system 
uh, to be on the lookout for other pests. So when pests come later in the season, the plant is much more resistant uh, than you would expect it to be. A good example of this is grapes in the San Joaquin Valley. There are two major spider mites that feed on these grapes. There's the uh, Pacific spider mite, which is the more economic of the pests, and then there's the Willamette mite, right? So during infestations, it turns out that if you get sort of a Willamette mite infestation early in the season, they don't do a whole lot of damage. But what they do is they put the plant on the lookout for other mites. And so they sort of upregulate their defensive mechanisms. So when you have the Pacific mites show up a little later in the season, the plants basically are already defending against them, and it doesn't allow the populations to establish real well. So you get a certain amount of control. Ah, and then you have sort of the weirdest of the bunch, which is apparent resistance. And apparent resistance can get you in a little bit of trouble if you're out there looking for resistant plant varieties. So apparent resistance is when a plant fails to become infected with a pathogen, but not because it's resistant, but rather because the pathogen did not have all the requirements it needed in order to infect the plant. So what this gets at is the idea of the disease triangle, which you probably learned about in pathology, right? Exactly. Pathogens need essentially three things, right, in order to infect a plant. Uh, one, you have to have the pathogen around. Two, you have to have the correct plant for it to feed on. And then three, you need to have the correct environmental conditions for the pathogen to actually infect the plant. And if you're missing any one of those three things, you're not going to get infection. So your plants are going to look resistant. They're going to be doing just fine. And so... Basically the, and so basically, the idea is that the plant will be apparently resistant when it actually is not. So the important thing around this is mostly just to recognize that in some cases, plants will look resistant, but it's not really any sort of genetic basis to that resistance. It's just random chance. And this is more important if you're out there, say, scouting a field, and you know, you've got some sort of pathogen that's causing a lot of trouble, and then you have this random patch of plants that look like they're doing really well. It may not be because they're resistant. It may just be that they're sitting on the one patch of soil in the field that actually is really well drained or something. It's sitting in such a place that it's missing one of these uh, sides of the triangle. Okay. All right. Oh, did I really put, there we go. So, what is the role of resistance in IPN? Why do we bring up resistance right now? Well, the nice thing about resistance, and the reason we talk about resistance in IPM classes, is that it's highly complementary to all other IPM tactics, more or less. Uh, in terms of cultural control, essentially what uh, resistant varieties do is they just amplify the effect of all of the other controls. So if you're out there doing sort of sanitation to reduce the total number of pests that are in the field, right, the next season you plant a bunch of resistant crops, uh, right off the bat you'll have less pests moving in to feed on those plants, but you'll also have plants that the pests don't do as well on. So that initial small population will grow more slowly than you expect. So you'll get even more control, right? Same idea with biocontrol. You have pests on the plants, and the pests aren't doing as well, but the defense that the plants provide doesn't hurt biocontrol. So your biocontrol actually becomes a little bit more effective than it would be on regular plants. And then finally with chemical control, because our populations are reduced, because they don't do as well on these plants, then we get to do less sprays. It costs us less money and introduces less toxins into the environment. So essentially, uh, while a resistant plant may not provide you 100% control, and while it might not be some silver bullet solution to the problem, uh, it does make all of your other control steps a little bit easier, and it makes it uh, generally a little bit stronger. So there are shortcomings to resistance. It's not, like I mentioned before, it's not a silver bullet. There are certain problems that you have to deal with when you're dealing with resistant plants. Uh, one of the challenges is that resistant plants aren't always resistant 24 hours. Uh, there can be certain environmental conditions that cause them to no longer be resistant. Uh, sometimes what you'll, I think the most common one I've heard of 
is that resistance oftentimes will break down under high temperature regimes. So um, some of that uh, resistant alfalfa, the uh, Lahontan uh, alfalfa variety, which is resistant to stem nematodes. Mm, excuse me. It works really well at cooler temperatures. So if you're doing like a spring planting, it does really well. But once you get above that 77 degrees Fahrenheit, it stops working as well. And similarly, nematode resistant tomatoes breaks down once you hit that 95 degrees Fahrenheit point. So, you know, you may have resistance sometimes, but not always. And that could be problematic if your pest shows up at about the same time you have those breakdowns. Do they know why that is? Is it because like plants can't multitask or something like that? I would be a little curious. I was, I was actually just talking about this. The, the general theory for plant pest interactions is that plants have sort of like a reservoir of energy that they can use, right? And uh, that reservoir basically has to be partitioned out into different roles, right? So it can use some of that energy for growth, it can use some of that energy for producing seeds, some of that energy for defending itself from pests. And so if at any time, you know, you have to put a lot of energy into, say, growth, that's energy that you can't put into pest defense, and vice versa. If you're defending against pests all the time, you can't grow. And so I would be curious if it is something like that, that if the plant is really heat stressed and it's putting a lot of energy into dealing with heat stress, maybe it's not putting as much energy into defending itself. Yeah, I'm thinking if it has to spend its energy transpiring, it can't put out the heat factor. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it has something to do with what you said. Um, could it be too because pests are more active in higher temperatures? Could be. It could be, yeah. I would be curious about that as well. Of probably more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think you're right, exactly, that we've got a couple things going on. So on one hand, the plant is probably a little more stressed. Uh, the pest might be, uh, yeah, more active. Uh, it's also possible that the protein that provides the resistance isn't super heat um, tolerant. And so when it gets hot, that protein stops working as well. And since plants can't really regulate their temperature very well, when it stops working, they just have to wait until it cools down for it to start working again. Because yeah, I was just looking at the temperatures there, it seems like 77 degrees would be much more um, suitable for um, nematode reproduction than 59 degrees. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But it also makes me wonder what it has to do with the enzyme activity, because as the, as the temperature warms up, there's more enzymatic activity within the plant. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if that's diverting the energy from the pest defenses. Exactly. Exactly. And so it, it seems like it's a complicated picture that... Uh, at these high temperatures, you see sometimes some cases where resistance is stronger during droughts or it's uh, weaker during droughts. You know, oftentimes it's a very sort of case-specific interaction. But temperature is one of the more common ones that you see across the board. And uh, so, yeah, I would be curious. I'm sure that people could look into it and figure it out. Don't look into it. No, not interested. Oh, fine. <laughs> All right. On the flip side. Their pests also have the ability to overcome resistance just like they can overcome pesticides, right? You can have the evolution of what we call resistance-breaking biotypes, which is basically a fancy way of saying insects that are resistant to resistance. And that's probably why we say resistance-breaking biotypes, because we don't want to say resistance too many times. Mm. But so essentially it's the same idea as resistance. You have pests that are unaffected by the defenses, they breed more successfully. Natural selection drives their genes to become more common. Uh, this is what my PhD work was on, was we were studying resistance-breaking biotypes of the soybean aphid. So this is a, these are two resistant soybean plants. Uh, one of them is infested with uh, the susceptible biotype of the aphid, or biotype 1. This resistant plant is infested with the resistant one, biotype 2. And as you can see, there's a pretty drastic difference in aphid success on those two plants. So um, we did a fair bit of research into that, and it looks like it's a very complicated issue. It looks like there's all sorts of little evolutionary hotspots all across the genome that are allowing the aphid to overcome this defense. So it's a, I don't know. I'll get out, I'll talk about that some other time. Oh, look at that, soybean aphid, bump. <laughs> all right, and then finally, um, one of the last big shortcomings of resistance is that oftentimes the resistance is really species specific. So a cultivar that may be resistant to one particular pest species may be highly susceptible to another. 
So if you've got a almond tree that's uh, resistant to brown rot, uh, it might not be resistant to Phytophthora. It may actually be super susceptible to Phytophthora, which is frustrating. And so you kind of have to pick your poison at that point, which one's easier to control. Uh, or even to a certain extent, it may be resistant to certain strains of a pest, but not to other strains. So you might have resistant to, you know, 60% of Phytophthora, but there might be 40 that you don't have any resistance to at all. And so you see a lot of publications where you'll have these complex tables where for every single variety they'll list out, you know, whether it's susceptible, whether it's resistant, whether it's partially resistant, odds and ends like that. So developing resistant plants. Oh, let's bust through this, see what we can get done. So as far as developing resistant plants are concerned, uh, from a breeding perspective, it's relatively simple to breed it into an annual crop because it's just a matter of conventional plant breeding, right? It's finding resistant individuals and crossing them. Uh, but from a perennial perspective, when you've got a plant that may be reared out by sort of um, scaffolding or raising them through scions and combined rootstock, uh, you're kind of in a unique position where you can choose a resistant rootstock and then graft it onto whatever particular crop scion you want. And so you can basically customize your plants to have a um, resistant rootstock, which is taking care of your vigor, fruit, nut size, cold hardiness, all of that, while you're having a scion on the top that is whichever particular crop you want. So you could maybe graft on a resistant rootstock onto a variety of the crop that is uh, much more profitable, even though that combination doesn't really occur naturally. So I kind of butchered that a little bit, but the general idea is that you can choose a scion or a rootstock that is resistant to particular pests, and you can mix and match them in order to get the most resistant profile that you want. Such as if you want some sort of a nemagard rootstock for nematodes, but you also want to have a hard shell variety almond on top to make sure that you have some extra resistance to navel orange worms, right? And as far as developing uh, resistant plants that are annuals that we plant every single year, we have two major approaches. You have the traditional approach, which is essentially identifying sources of resistance in the host population, and then using propagation through sexual reproduction of the plant in order to pass those genes along. So basically, you would go to a seed bank that has a whole bunch of crop varieties in it. And this happened when the soybean aphid was introduced. They wanted to find soybean aphid resistant soybeans. So what they did was they went to the USDA, they collected all of the soybean varieties they had, which I think at the time was like 800 species, 800 cultivars or something like that. They grew them out in pots and they infested them with soybean aphids. They took all the plants that were the most resistant and they crossbred them with one another. They crossbred them with um, the cultivars that are most economically uh, sustainable. And they basically tried to create plants that had all of the great agronomic qualities while also being resistant. And you just basically keep repeating this over generations and generations and generations until you get that ideal plant. And there's any number of breeding techniques you can use. This is not a breeding class, so I'm not gonna go over them in great detail. But the basic idea is that this will get you your resistant plant but it is challenging to breed plants like this that have multiple resistant genes, and it also takes a long time. On the flip side, we now have biotechnology, right? We have the ability to basically uh, cross species that aren't closely related to one another because we can insert genes directly into the crop's genome. So we can create these transgenic crop cultivars or those where the gene that has been inserted is there artificially rather than through natural pollination, right? And so with this, we can create things like uh, Bt corn, where you have a corn plant that is expressing a bacteria gene that provides resistance. So I'm just gonna click through Apologies to those who aren't done reading or writing. But so just two examples, the first of which would be the uh, BT crop, 
So BT crops are those that express uh, genes from the Bacillus thuringiensis, which is a bacteria. And uh, essentially, this is kind of a cool gene. Uh, the toxin is a nice little crystal. When a lepidopteran comes along and eats it, the chemical, the crystal goes into their gut and gets digested into the active form that actually kills the lepidopteran. And basically, the uh, protein it produces just holds open the gut pores so that uh, all the gut contents and all the cell contents just kind of mix together, and the caterpillar can't digest anything anymore. So it starves to death. Uh, and BT is real common across a variety of crops. And then finally, they've also genetically engineered papaya to basically carry around a copy of the papaya ring spot virus. And this acts as sort of a natural vaccine for the papaya. The papaya now knows how to recognize the virus, and so it knows how to turn on its immune system as soon as the virus shows up, and it stops the infection. And uh, this was really a lifesaver for the papaya industry in Hawaii. When ring spot virus showed up, it was looking like papaya would be completely unsustainable to grow there. But now 76% of the papaya out there is transgenic uh, for this resistance effect. And uh, it really saved the industry. They're still doing pretty fine now. But so uh, genetically modified crops have their whole own host of ethical issues that people are uh, a little bit wary of. And we'll talk about those next week. Uh, first lecture will be on... Genetic technologies for pest control. Yeah, just put that on PDF. We didn't get there on PDF. Yeah.